So happy Advent, everybody. Jesus, of course, is on the way. And as you always have to do when a very important guest, or when any guest, is on the way, is prepare to meet them. Uh, it's, when I was a kid, I used to have this, you know, we had to do chores. And one of the things that I would always tell myself when I was doing chores was, pretend the Queen of England is visiting. And then that would, make, that would motivate me to make it as clean as possible because the, the Queen of England lives in a beautiful palace. And so if she was going to come to my house, I'd have to make it prepared to be as much like a beautiful palace as possible. And of course, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived in heaven and came down to meet us. So we have to be prepared to make our world as much, and our hearts, as much like heaven as possible so that he is welcome here. That's what Advent is about. We're not just waiting passively, but we're waiting and making preparation for him to come. And so we're going to look at the last chapter here, chapter 7 of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's going to show us some ways to prepare to receive Jesus, which is why our Advent theme is called Preparation for Communion, because when Jesus comes physically to meet us in the Incarnation, when he was born on Christmas, it's so that he could commune with us. And it's the same reason that he told us to eat the bread and drink the cup, so that he could physically commune with us. And we have to prepare to do that, just like I had to prepare for the queen, who never ended up showing up when I was a kid. But Jesus showed up, and he will show up again. So today we're going to start with, uh, with the theme of watching yourself. So we have to make sure that when God comes, we are ready to see him when he shows up. And in order to be with God, in order to see God and enjoy God, we have to be like him, holy and righteous. Isaiah 64, as Christy read, says, God gladly meets those who do right, those who remember him, in their ways. In other words, God will gladly commune with people who are holy. But the scripture goes on to say, but you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself. We transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. In other words, God gladly meets all who are holy. The problem is that we are not holy. We are full of sin. And that sin gets in between us and God. Isaiah 59, verse 2, couldn't possibly be clearer. Your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God. Our sins blind us from seeing God. They, they put obstacles in our way. So God is there, but we're not quite making the connection. And it's our sin that gets in the way. So part of preparing for communion with God means watching our lives so that we sin less so that there are fewer barriers and our vision is clearer when God shows up. And so today's scripture is going to teach us how to sin less. And another way to say that is to become more holy, to become holier. And we will see that we cannot possibly be holy and at the same time be holier than thou. There is a huge difference but we will see that it is possible to help other people become holy and ready to be with God. But it doesn't come from being holier than thou. In fact, at the end of the day, we'll see that the only person who can make people holy enough to meet God is God himself. First, let's pray. Lord God, we pray that even today, as we encounter your word, you would be working by your Holy Spirit in us to make us holy and righteous in your sight, to bring us into the image of Jesus Christ, who we are waiting for and who we have already received. So Lord, open your word to us today and change us by its power. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we're going to start with a passage that's very often misunderstood and misinterpreted. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. And it's very tempting and very common to interpret this passage as everybody just mind your own business. Right? What other people do is their decision. It's up to them, their life. Don't get involved. Don't tell other people what they should and should not do. Just mind your own business. And that's a very well-meaning interpretation because we don't want to be offensive and we don't want to hurt people. We don't want to be bossy. We don't want to be holier than thou. But it's not actually a right interpretation at all. Because sometimes other people are wrong and need help to see the, that they're wrong, that they're hurting people, that they don't know the truth. Sometimes people need help seeing those things. Sometimes we need help seeing those things. So do not judge cannot possibly mean, in a Christian context, mind your own business and just live your own life, live and let live, don't bother anybody, don't tell them what to do. That can't possibly be what it means. Okay, so what does it mean? And we have to look at the illustration that Jesus gives us to help understand the nuance of what he's telling us here. So in verse 3, Jesus says, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, Let me take the speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? I've never had a problem with a log getting stuck in my eye. I've had sand in my eye. I've had an eyelash in my eye. I've never had a log in my eye. So I don't think he's being literal here. I think the log is a metaphor for sin. The log and the speck are a metaphor for sin. And as we saw in Isaiah, sin is a barrier to God. And sin prevents you from seeing God. Just like a, a log in your eye or a speck in your eye would prevent you from seeing anything that's before you. So that's what he's saying here. You have a problem with sin that's causing you from, to not be able to see God. And yet... You see somebody else's very, very small barrier, very, very small little clouded vision. And you say, and you get really upset, right? And you might even go over and try to fix their sin. Say, ah, oh, you're, not, you're not seeing God clearly. Let me, let me get that speck out of your eye. But, the, but you're completely unaware of your own sin, right? So it's like a guy with a log in his eye sees somebody that's kind of going like this and says, here, let me help you with that. Right? And you kind of see the log coming towards your eye, and you're like, uh-oh. It's like if you go to the doctor's office, and you say, you know, I've got a cold. And the doctor says, <coughs> open wide. And you say, I don't know, I don't know, doc. You appear to be pretty sick yourself and not really know it. I think I'll get more sick if you try to help me. Right? I think that if you try to take a speck out of my eye while you have a log in your eye, you might actually poke my eye out. You're probably not going to help me very much, and that's exactly how it works. It's not going to do much good. Both people are going to end up being more blind, more sick, less ready to be with God. But the reality is, that's how we all function. By nature, we are much more inclined to see other people's faults than our own. And we get much more upset about other people's faults than we do about our own. Think, if you don't believe me, just think about this. Have you ever cut someone off in traffic and honked at yourself? Because shame on me for driving so poorly. Of course not. That's not how we work. When other people cut us off, we honk, and they're the worst driver on the road. How did they get a license, right? But when we cut people off, it's, uh, you know, sorry, buddy, but the traffic pattern, you know, I, I had to. There was really no other way. I had to go. Or, you know, I was late. I, I had to do it. There's always an excuse when it's our flaw. And when it's someone else's flaw, there's never an acceptable excuse, right? We're so much better at seeing other people's flaws, and we get so much more upset about them than our own. 
that just a, a funny statistic, 90% of people in studies think that they're above average drivers. So if you know anything about statistics, you don't have to be an expert to know only 50% of people can be above average drivers. That's how average works. But 90% of people think that they're above average drivers, which means that 40% of them are wrong about how good they are at driving. But that's, that's just how human beings think. We're hyper aware of other people's flaws and oblivious to our own, and we get angry with other people's flaws but we make excuses for our own. And driving, you know, driving is a silly example, but it's very serious when it involves sin. Because, you know, we have a very easy time finding the sinful people out there and declaring other people sinful. And we usually think we know exactly what they need to change in order to not be sinful anymore. We know because we're right on track. We've got it figured out. We're basically making it. And so you have all sorts of ideas, right? I mean, the examples are endless. You look at how somebody else raises their kids, and you've got all sorts of ideas about how they're really raising their kids the wrong way. Right? They're, really, they're really screwing up. And, you know, they should do it more like me. Or the per way somebody dresses, you know, that's a little too revealing. That's a little too flashy. I don't like the way that they dress. They should, you know, what they should really do is, and you list a few things, and, and they all say, you know, I think everybody should wear blue suits and white shirts and purple ties and purple socks and brown shoes. That's really, then they would be modest. Oh, right? They should really just look more like me. Because I've got to figure it out. There's, whatever it is, we've got that person or that group of people that we just know they're doing it wrong. They're sinning. They're full of sin, and we're angry at them. And you might even say, you know what, no, that's, that's not who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm very tolerant. I'm a, I'm, I believe in tolerance and acceptance, and I just hate judgmental people. There it is. You're judgmental against judgmental people. Everybody is judgmental of somebody. We've all got that group out there that we know what they're doing wrong and we know exactly what they need to do to change, to not be sinful anymore, and be more like us, who have it figured out. It's like, I think if you did a study, like they did with drivers, 90% of people would say they're above average on the good people scale. 90% of people would say they're above average morality, and above average at not sinning. And Obviously, even if you could rank that, it's not how it goes. It can't be. The reality is, we don't have it figured out. We don't know what people should do. We don't even know what we should do. But we still want to correct people as if we had a position of authority, of moral authority, as if we really did know. And that's when the holier-than-thou attitude comes out when we think that we're in a position to correct other people, to pass a judgment on their life or their lifestyle, because we're better than them. And the reality is, of course, we're not better than them. No Christian could ever possibly believe that. I mean, just look at for one of many examples is Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Or if you, you, know, you want to go back to what Christy read this morning, uh, you were angry and we sinned. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds that we think are so good and we've got it figured out are like a filthy cloth. Christians believe in original sin. Look, we're all sinful. No, no, none of us is right. None of us has got it all figured out. None of us is doing morality the right way. No person is any better than any other person. Every single person is in the same exact boat, struggling with sin and being totally unholy in the sight of a holy God. So if we think that we can stop other people from sinning because we have it figured out, it will never work. We'll be doctors coughing in their face. We'll be people with logs in our eyes trying to fix their, their vision. Or we'll be like people with an unlit candle smacking their candle trying to get it to light. It'll never work. So Jesus says this, 
How about we do it this way? This is Matthew 7, verse 5. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. So before you go to take a small speck out of someone else's eye, right, make sure that you can see. Make sure your eye is clear. In other words, before you try to tell someone else about their sin, make sure that you are aware of your sin and that you've dealt with it. We're going to talk about two really practical aspects of this teaching. And the first is that it gives us a strategy for how to become more holy. In other words, it's going to literally tell us how do you get rid of those barriers between you and God and get more ready to receive him. There's a, there's a practical strategy for that. And it's also going to show us that we can actually be more effective at helping other people become more holy. We've got to take care of ourselves first. It's like the airline. They always say, put on your mask first. Right? Then you can help somebody else. So we're going to put on our mask first and watch ourselves, watch our own lives. And then we can talk about how that helps us help other people. So let's look closely at this teaching. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. And now the, the word for speck is really refers to sawdust. So what they're talking about is, if you don't know what sawdust is, it's a very, very small piece of wood that, you know, left over from sawing a piece of wood. And a log, if you don't know what a log is, is a very large piece of wood. So we have a small piece of wood and a large piece of wood. In other words, it's the same material that's in their eye, that's in your eye, just to different extent. And if you think about what that really means, it means that usually the things that we get the most angry about in other people, the sins that we notice the quickest in other people, the same kind of sin is in our life. That's why we hate it so much. Because we hate that we do it, but it's easier to say, to blame the other person and judge them than it is to look at our own life and blame us and hate the sin in our own life. That's why it's not a coincidence that Jesus calls it a speck and a log. Because that's how human nature works. If you're a psychologist, you call it projection. But you don't have to be a psychoanalyst to know that that's true. You can either live or you can read the Bible. So we judge people, and, and if, you, if you search your heart, I think you'll find that this is true. We judge other people the harshest for the things that we hate about ourselves. Romans 2, verse 1, is not, uh, it, it doesn't go easy on us for this tendency. Because it says this, Therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. So the stricter you judge people for doing the things that you hate about yourself, the stricter you're judging yourself. And Jesus points this out for a reason, not to make us feel bad, well, feeling bad is an important part of it. That's not where it ends. This, this attitude, this realization can actually help us become more holy. It can actually help us grow in how we live and remove barriers between us and God. Because what he wants us to do is adapt an attitude of humility so that whenever we see someone doing something wrong and start to judge them, there's a stop. And, we, and instead of judging them, we say, wait a second, do I do that? Where in my life do I do that? So I'll just give you an example. You see somebody, I don't know, doing something that you think is selfish. And that anger starts to rise and the judgments start to come out. Gosh, that is so selfish of them. I can't believe they would do that. that they would have so, so much disrespect. And as soon as those judgments start to come out, you pause and say, wait a second, where am I selfish? How am I, I'm noticing it in them, can I notice it in myself? Is there still selfishness in my life that I can get rid of? So any time, well, this is an amazing strategy that he gives us, because any time 
you notice someone else doing something wrong, it becomes an opportunity for you to identify your own sin and become more holy, right? And get rid of that sin and ask God to take it away from you. Other people's sins are an opportunity now, not to get angry, but for you to, to turn the mirror on yourself and see the ways that you are not prepared for communion with God. And if you do that, we get to the second part. You actually become much better able to help people become holy. Because if you've already looked at yourself and recognized the depth of your sin, and recognized that you're doing the same exact things that you're getting mad at other people for doing, you know better than them. You can't be judgmental at that point. If you're aware of how sinful you are, you can't, you can't possibly look down your nose at somebody when you know that you yourself are no better. What you can do is help them get ready to receive God by removing the same barriers that you're working on alongside them. Galatians 6 verse 1 says this, Brethren, even if any man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of of gentleness. So I just want you to notice, if anybody is caught in sin, restore that person. In, order, in other words, help them become righteous in a spirit of gentleness. That is completely different from mind your own business. And it's also completely different from being holier than thou. It's, it's saying, look, I see this happening in your life. It happens in my life. I'm selfish too. I'm greedy too. I'm lustful too. Let's walk together. Let's see what we can do. Let's, make, let's get more holy. That's a completely different attitude. You're not saying, mind your own business. You're not saying, I'm better than you. But you've started with watching your own life. Asking God to transform your own life. Growing more holy yourself. And only then, you're naturally going to be gentle and kind and not judgmental. Because a holier-than-thou attitude has been replaced by actual holiness. Right? You, you can feel holier-than-thou, or you can ask God, let, let me be actually holy. And you won't need to feel holier-than-thou anymore, you'll just be holy. So Jesus has, this is amazing advice, just practical advice on how to become more holy and bring down those barriers that come between us and God. He says this, if you want to say it in one sentence, Hate your own sin more than you hate other people's sin. That's it. And it just so happens that when other people sin, it helps us see what it is that we should be improving in ourselves. It's, a, it's amazing, amazing that God has worked it that way and showed us how we can become more holy. Uh, the only thing we have to remember is that Jesus, although Jesus gives us this really excellent, wise counsel, advice, and it works. Following his advice isn't what makes us holy at the end of the day. It's Jesus himself who makes us holy. If I can just read Colossians 1, verses 21 through 23. It says, And you who were once estranged, estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, which he's talking to all of us, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith. So Jesus Christ, he was holy. If anybody was ever justified to have a holier-than-thou attitude, it would have been Jesus Christ. There was no barrier between him and God. He said, I and the Father are one. There was no sin, there was nothing. Just Jesus, God, boom. Perfect. And what he chose to do was die on a cross so that we could have the holiness, the closeness with God that he had, that only he had, so that we could stand before God Receive his blessing. Be in God's presence. Be prepared for communion. So any holiness that we have, any merit, any goodness 
comes from him. It comes from his death on the cross. And if that's true, how could we ever judge somebody else? How could we ever stand above somebody else? It's impossible. All we can do is go back to his advice. Humbly obey his commandment. Cleanse our lives from sin. Help others do the same. And as Paul said, continue securely established and steadfast in the faith. With that, I'd invite you to stand. And if you are ready to accept that only the sacrifice of Jesus Christ can make you ready to be with God, and you are ready to commit to obeying his commands and grow in holiness, then let's say the confession of faith together. And if that's not you today, just meditate on the words of Zechariah here in terms of what God has done for us and what he could do for you. Now let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior from the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days.